Psalm 1, those six verses ascribe two ways. That there's two ways to live. There's two eternities. There, there is two types of people. And the same way is through the book of Proverbs as well. That we saw that especially in last chapter, we, have the, we had two voices calling at us. We had the voice of the uh, of Lady Wisdom and Lady Foolishness, the foolish woman that these two voices are calling us to go, and each of them describe each of them calling us to to two different ways to live, two different eternities, two different types of, uh, of people because there is the wicked, there is the righteous. There is the way that leads to death. There is the way that leads to life. There is those eternities. And Lady Wisdom represented the way to God, the way to life, the way of righteousness, the way of the godly as described that in, in, <clears throat> in Psalm 1 that began, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and his leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. And so Lady Wisdom represents that way, the way of the righteous, the way of the godly. Lady Foolishness represents... The wicked are not so in Psalm 1, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand the judgment, or sinners in, a seat of, in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And so the, that we find there's two ways, there's, two types of, there's only two types of people in this world, the righteous and the ungodly, the wise and the foolish, the way that leads to life and, it's, and to heaven, to God, the way that leads to death and destruction, the way of Satan there. And so you have those ways. We have Lady Wisdom was calling to us, while way, Lady Foolishness was disguised herself as being wise when she knew nothing, and her way leads to death and destruction. And so we've seen those illustrated in the first nine chapters that about wisdom, the importance of listening to wisdom rather than the foolishness. Over again, a call to wisdom, a call that here, the listen. And now, as the beginning of chapter 10, shows us how wisdom looks. How wisdom looks between a father and mother and their child. How wisdom looks at possessions and wealth. How wisdom looks at work. How wisdom looks at those in authority. How wisdom uses their words. How wisdom forgives. And so wisdom is showing us the way that we ought to go. Because there's the way of ungodly as well. And the ungodly is highlighted in this chapter and throughout the rest of the, of the Psalms that speaks of this is the way the righteous live, this is the way the wicked are. And so we find ourselves in chapter 1 of Proverbs 10 that wise parents teach their children to be wise. The prophet Solomon, a wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish son is a grief to his mother. It's assuming that the parents are themselves wise here. And so a wise son makes a, a father glad, as the scriptures say. While a foolish son is going to be a grief to his mother. This doesn't mean that only sons make their fathers glad and bring joy. And wise sons don't bring joy to their mothers. While only why uh, foolish sons are a grief to their mothers and, and the same can't be said of a father's. Well, that's not what the Bible's saying. This is put in a... What is true of the father is going to be true of the mother there as well. Both fathers, both the father and mother are going to be glad. 
They're going to be joyous when their sons are wise. And we could say the same thing for daughters as well. And then both fathers and mothers are going to be grieved. They're going to be sad, heartbroken when they have a foolish son or a foolish daughter. And so what is a wise son? A wise son is one who is going to listen to his father and mother says. He's going to obey his father and mother. He's going to show honor to their, his father and mother. Just as the scripture says, honor your father and your mother for this right in the sight of the Lord. Or as well that children obey your parents. So a wise son is going to do that. A, do, a wise son is going to desire to walk with the Lord. And notice that desire that he is not going to be able to, nobody can do that perfectly. We cannot do any of that perfectly. But there's a desire that's going to get Walk closer and closer to the Lord. A wise son loves God's word. A wise son fears the Lord. A wise son loves God. A wise son submits to those who are authority. We find that as a huge, huge problem in this country right now. It is submitting as a, as a lack of respect for authority. There is a huge... Respect and authority does not mean you cannot speak out against injustice and evil, wherever it may be. Because a lot of people take it as that respect and authority means you don't question me. That here you have congressmen that have that attitude, you have judges that have that attitude, you have police officers that have that attitude, you have pastors that have that attitude that don't question my authority, but that's not what that means. You can show honor and respect and disagree. You find that illustrated in Daniel's life that comes in and shows honor to King Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, King, may you live forever. That was a way of showing respect. But at the same time, he said, you find him, you know, turn. You know, when he's interpreting these dreams, tell him Nebuchadnezzar, you need to listen to God, especially when the one that Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of this here, this image, the statue, and he's telling him, you need to, you need to humble yourself. What Nebuchadnezzar does is build, a, build probably is, builds the statue that he sees. That's the one that we see where the, it's probably the same one in his vision. It's the same one he built the people to bow down to. And then you find a year later, he's going out and saying, did not my hand, you know, I built Babylon. He's humbled and God seven years. And Daniel respectfully told him, you need to humble yourself. And Nebuchadnezzar learned the hard way. And so respect for authority doesn't mean you cannot point out wrong, and speak, but you can do it in a respectful manner. A wise son is also going to see how valuable and how precious wisdom is and desire to grow in wisdom. A wise son is careful about who he's close friends with. A wise friend avoids the greedy and violent people described in Proverbs chapter 1. A wise son avoids the adulterous woman who offers easy sex. A wise son doesn't behave like the fool or scoffer that's mentioned as well in these chapters. And so this makes the father glad. This makes the mother rejoice. Because that's what that word also means. And so when parents are themselves walking with God, then they will rejoice and be glad when their children as well are walking with the Lord. Though it may not be perfect, but seeing a progression. Third, John, the Apostle John wrote this, Though he is speaking of spiritual children, those who he led to the Lord... It still rejoices the par- heart when parents see their children walk, walk with God and can say the same thing as John said in 3 John 1, 4. I have no greater than jo- joy than this. What is this joy? To hear of my children walking in the truth. Walking in the truth. That's what makes the father and mother glad. A wise son, a wise daughter who is walking with God. However, the Bible also says a foolish son is a grief to his mother in Proverbs 10.1. This also means sorrow, heartache. A foolish son or daughter is going to bring grief 
and sorrow to their parents and their family, and even those they, around them when they are fools. Because a foolish son doesn't listen to his father and mother. Because a foolish son thinks he's the authority. A foolish son is arrogant and proud. A foolish son doesn't desire to walk with God. A foolish son is not teachable. That's why they don't listen. A foolish son doesn't love God's word. A foolish son does not fear the Lord. A foolish son does not love God. A foolish son does not submit to those in authority. A foolish son, and, so, and because they don't, I should say, I'm back for a moment, because they don't submit to authority, they're the ones who are not respectful of authority. That whether it be a police officer, that you see the people that are arrogant and proud, and you see that against judges, you see that against parents, you see that against pastors, that the rejecting of authority rather than submissing, submitting. A foolish son does not see how valuable wisdom is and doesn't desire, and because of that does not desire to grow in wisdom because they see themselves as wise when they're fools. A foolish son rejects wisdom and embraces being a fool. A foolish son is not careful who they are close friends with. A foolish son doesn't avoid the greedy and violent people, but becomes friends with them. Not evangelizing them, but becoming close friends and, be like, and become like them. A foolish son doesn't avoid the adulterous woman who offers easy sex, but instead go with her, goes with her. And then a son, a, a foolish son, will become as a scoffer. He will be a grief to his parents and bring them sorrow, while a wise son or a daughter will make their parents glad. And so the actions of a child, even, even a grown-up child, can impact the family. In ancient cultures, the honor of a family was connected to their children, especially the oldest son. The son, by his actions, could bring honor or shame to his family and become a disgrace, and bring disgrace upon the, the people, and on, I should say, a disgrace on his family, especially his father and mother. And honor was, shame and honor was held great, greatly back then. That it, that the, and in some culture it still is, that where they may, if you bring shame to them, they may end up executing you. And so it's still true in a way today. A son or a daughter who's committing crimes or doing drugs brings shame and grief to their family. And you see that in extreme of some parents that, you, you do see some parents, they'll defend their children no matter what. They could have never done that. And then others, they're like, they're just heartbroken that their child did that. Even they may be 40, 50 years old, and they're still heartbroken. That here And they're apologizing to the, the vi victims' families that we're sorry that our son, we're sorry our daughter did that. And it brings grief. And so it's important to teach children God's Word. It's important for fathers and mothers to teach their children, spend time with them. Deuteronomy 6, 5-7, through 7, You shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and all your might, with all your might. These words which I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and while you lie down and when you rise up. So it's important to set a godly example. You cannot tell them one thing and do the opposite. You can't do, say, do as I say and not as I do. You have to set an example. And even an example in saying, I'm sorry I did that, I'm, I was wrong. Otherwise, you'll be like the foolish woman. If you, if you are not humble, if you will not admit when you're wrong, if you're not going to teach God's Word, I should say, even if you teach God's Word and you set a bad example, you're going to be like the, the foolish woman. The wise woman builds her house in Proverbs 14.1. But the foolish woman tears it down with her own hands, saying one thing, but by actions doing another. Or attitudes doing another. So understand, there are times when, you know, does this guarantee that uh, when you teach, I just say, 
Let me back for a moment. By teaching God's word, by setting a godly example, by doing your best, by living for God's glory and honor, being humble and admitting when you have sinned against them, and making it right, and by spending time in God's word, by taking them to church, does this guarantee you will not have a foolish child? No. It doesn't guarantee, it doesn't guarantee that. Guarantee that. There are times when I, there's pastors whose sons or daughters who have rejected the Lord. They have spent, they, they, and godly, they set God examples. And so they end up growing up and rejecting God's word, and that's a heartache. And so there's nothing you can do except pray and, and to the Lord and bring that to God and, and talk with them. But if you want a guarantee to raise a foolish child, raise a foolish child, then don't set a God the example. Don't admit when you've done wrong. Don't spend time in God's word. And then it will, and then it will only be God's great by God's grace and His mercy that your child isn't a fool if you neglect these things, because you're almost guaranteeing. As I said, without the grace of God intervening, a foolish child on the path of hell. So fathers, pray for your children. Ask God to help you be a God example in your words, attitudes, actions, priorities. And read God's word to them and with them. And grandparents, you can do the same. Praying for your grandchildren. Asking God's help to be, your, be a God example. Because you know what? There's no greater legacy than you can leave behind than a life lived for the Lord. That you have set a godly example in your attitudes, your priorities, the way you lived your life, leave a legacy. It's much more valuable when somebody looks back upon you and remembers your life, remembers the times they spent with you, that they're remembering, they, let, they set a godly example. Because money can come and go. Inheritance can be spent up. It can, be, it can weather through because of bills and all kinds of things, or things could be stolen. There's all kinds of ways that things can be lost. And even if somebody wisely uses it, it's still going to come to an end. But however, leaving a God example, that, doesn't, that cannot be stolen. It cannot, it cannot go away. And so leaving a godly example is, a, you can, is one of the best things you can do. And even if you are able to read God's word to and with them. And so set a godly example. And then also now wisdom. Wisdom is it's living out in our practical lives. Helps you to glorify God with your possessions. Verse 2 says, Ill-gotten gains do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. What are ill-gotten gains? What does the Bible mean by that? Well, it is wealth, it is possessions, it's anything we describe as money, whether gold and jewels, any of those things that are not earned through hard work, honesty, and diligence. It is not, it's... And there's many ways it can be done, that something cannot be done through, I mean, not earned through hard work, diligence, and honesty. I mean, employers can do this by underpaying their employees, or you can say, not give them a decent wage. Now, not every business can pay somebody, you know, like GM did in the past, and, and some of these bigger car companies that, that people make a, a good living. The, a decent wage is definitely dependent upon whatever business it is and what they're selling. But there are way, there have been businesses who have cheated their employees that, that pay them barely anything while they themselves have grown and grown. It's one thing that for a, a, a business to grow and grow and they're paying their employees well. Employees can do this by not working as they should by taking longer breaks or more breaks than they should, or by goofing off instead of working or lazy, or as I've seen in some of the places where I was, that intentionally going at a very slow pace. 
But I, I've, seen, I've seen that before. I've seen the goofing off. I've seen people take more breaks than they should or taking longer breaks or even clocking out on breaks they're not supposed to. I, I should say not clocking, I'm sorry, the reverse, not clocking out on breaks as they're supposed to. And so ill-gotten gains is acquired at the expense of others. It could be done through stealing. It could be done through dishonesty. It could be done through get-quick-rich schemes. And so the Bible says that that does not profit. And when the Bible talks about that, it's talking about eternal value because people who have done these things and have gained money off the back of expense of others have lived in luxury for a time. And sometimes all the way to the grave. But then what? Then what? It does not profit internal value. If they live comfortably in this life, they will not in the next because they spend eternity in hell. Look at verse 2. While ill-gotten gains do not profit, righteousness delivers from death. Righteousness delivers from death. What are we talking about? Most of the righteous earn their possessions and money through hard work and diligence. The wicked get it through ill-gotten gains at times. But the righteous earn those things through hard work and diligence and honesty and being trustworthy. They don't, and then also they do not steal, but instead are generous and use their possessions to help others. 1 John chapter 3, 17 18 says, but whoever has the world's goods <coughs> but see, and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but indeed in truth. Or we could say, don't just love it with your words, but love in your actions as well. Don't just tell somebody you love them. Show them you love them by meeting a need. And that's the way the righteous, they are the ones that are generous. And so they're not lazy. They don't take, the righteous don't take longer breaks or more breaks than they should. The righteous, if they own a business, they do not cheat their workers, but pay as they're able to, whatever it may be. And so what does it mean that righteousness delivers from death? You know that everyone in this world is going to be born who's going to die. I mean, everyone born in this world is going to die. The only way that you're not going to die is if Christ, when Christ returns for his church and we meet him in the air and we receive a, receive a glorified body. That's the only way any of us are not going to see death. And so the fact is, is it's a point, of one, point of, unto man wants to die. And so you know that everyone will die. Unbelievers die. Believers die. Believers die at young ages and old ages and in between. And unbelievers, the same thing. So all will die. No one can escape death except for the situation I mentioned. But however, the righteous, that they will, God will deliver them from eternal death. He will bring them to heaven for eternity. Because a life of righteousness is a mark of one who is walking with the Lord. One who has been saved. One who is, we would say, because of the gospel, that they have been justified and sanctified. And that they are living for God. That they are, been, they are the Holy Spirit dwelling inside them and making them more like Christ. So righteousness is a mark of one who is walking with God. And so it is the person, it is that person who will not be cast into hell. But God will bring them into heaven for eternity. And so the point is that righteousness has far greater value in this life than the and as well as the next than all the possessions of the world. Paul talked about that when he talked about um, exercises, uh, of a body of the exercise is a little profit, but godliness is profitable both for this life and the next. He's not saying exercise is bad. He's just saying exercise is only limited the benefits to this life, while godliness benefits now and into eternity. 
And so godliness has greater value. Math, not Matthew, Mark 8, 35-37. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what, a man, for what will a man give in exchange for his soul? That you have there. What does it profit a person? What does ill-gotten gains profit? They don't. They don't. That's why elsewhere in the Proverbs it says it's better to have, it's better to be, um, it's, well, I'll sum it up that it's better to be righteous and have little than to ha have much and be, and be wicked. Look at verse 3 with me now. Continue on this theme of possessions. The Lord will not allow the righteous to hunger, but he will reject the craving of wicked. The Lord honors those who honor him. And notice the name of the Lord that's used. It's all capital letters. That's the name Yahweh, the great I Am, the self-existent one, the eternal God, the one who has created us and made us, the one who owns all things. This is the God who will supply the needs of those who follow him. Now, this doesn't mean that God will not allow for a season or a time for a believer to do without and even to have little food. Because Paul talked about that when he said that, he talked about, I learned contentment. There, he talked about there were seasons of life that where he had little, and he went hungry, and he was full. And so it doesn't mean that God will not allow that to happen. But God in the end will supply the needs of those who follow him, and those who are his people. Matthew 6, 31-33. Do not worry then saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But you know what? God doesn't make that same promise to the wicked. In the end, they will not give what they desire. They have these cravings that they... Some will use these cravings and these desires to gain off the backs of others. We've seen that in the ill-gotten gains, we would say. They hear they cheat and are dishonest. That They may cheat on their taxes. They may keep two different books in their business to hide what they're doing. You have, you have people like, um, I think his name was Bernie Madoff that did that. Uh, scheme in, on Wall Street and there's others who've done that as well he's not the first and he probably will not be the last will cheat people but in the end they will not get their desires their desires will be rejected they ignore the cries of the poor and will find that God will ignore them they show no mercy when they gained at the expense of others and God will show no mercy to them God will withhold from them in the end and they'll suffer in eternity Look at verse 4 with me. Poor is he who works with a negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. The Bible states that those who are lazy are the ones who are usually poor. Those who are diligent gain possessions of wealth. And so believers should work hard and put it in an honest day's work. Many times those who work hard will have what they need. And this is why this verse connects wealth with hard work. That here, and, and wealth is not always what we think of gold and silver and money. A lot of times in the Old Testament, wealth was possessions of flock, livestock, and as well as crops and things like that. And so this is true most of the time. Because there's, there's times where that's not always the case. There are times when you do all you can and cannot seem to get ahead. You have different seasons in your life. Where do you go with you when you have, a, God allows you to have a little bit more so you can share with others and you, can, and, you have, and you have more to share and more as well to give and more to save and more to, to spend? 
But then there's, all, there's times you go season of life that is a struggle. You do all you can. You put an honest day's work in. You work hard. You're not lazy. You're not like, like th those that take advantage of their boss. But you can't seem to get ahead. You're passed over for a raise. Taxes go up, whether it be property tax, sales tax, license fees, tag renewals. That's just a few examples. Toll roads going up. You have all these things. The price of food goes up. Electricity goes up. Water rates go up. Glass, gasoline prices fluctuate. And then it's hard to find even another job if you want to at times. And so it's not always works like that. And that's because it... That's because of the curse. The sin came in. Look at verse 4 with me. Again, poor is he who works with negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent make rich. Not everyone who is rich had worked hard. Those who obtained wealth through dishonest means. You know that's true because of the previous verses that, that talked about ill-gotten gains. There's those who have cheated, there's people who have lied, there's people who are lazy, who have gotten as well that get rich quick things that they have done and they have all this money through those ways. And, you, and so it's not always that way. But no matter what, you should always do your work for God's glory. You'd always do it, work hard. Because 1 Corinthians 10.31, Whether then you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And we also should be content with what God has given to us and be thankful to Him as well. Look at verse 5. He who gathers in the summer is the son who acts wisely, but he who sleeps in harvest is the son who acts shamefully. This verse describes the harvest season. A wise son works hard. He is concerned not only for his welfare, but his family. And so he prepares the soil, gets the seed prepared and plants, asks God to provide rain. If he irrigated and brought water to the fields as well. And then at harvest, he harvests the right time. He is watching when, when those crops are ready to be, to be harvested. And so this son is like the ant. Proverbs 6, 8, prepares for food in the summer and gathers provision to harvest. This son is prudent like Joseph who gathered and stored grain during the prosperous years because of the famine coming. A wise son. However, the foolish one is a sluggard. Sleep has become more important. That's why it says he who sleeps in a harvest is a son who acts shamefully. That would be very foolish. If you have planted and done all those things and then you just sleep through the harvest when you should have been gathering, it's going to bring shame upon you because sleep was more important at that time. Like the grasshopper and the story. If you remember that story about the grasshopper and the ant, the grasshopper would play around all the time in the summertime would play music and play games and mock the ant. Well, the ant gathered and worked hard. All throughout the summer and into the early fall, the ant just kept on working hard while the grasshopper played and laughed and mocked. But the grasshopper wasn't laughing and mocking when winter came. It starved. And so there's a wasting of time. It's, it would be very foolish and stupid to do that. But this one, but this one, but here's the sluggard. He'll bring shame when he's young, bring shame when he's old. He let opportunities pass him by. First, he didn't provide for his family. First Timothy 5 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And so what lessons can you and I learn? Learn from this. Well, you know that sleep is important. 
You need sleep to function. God, God had, he has made us to where we need sleep. But we need a certain amount of sleep. But the sleep here is one who is one that sleep has become more important. That's become the most important thing. That that's what they do. Whether sleeping in bed or resting in a chair, this would be the type of person today that would be sleeping all throughout the day. And they'd be entertaining themselves with TV or video games. And I'm not talking about somebody who's retired from work. I'm talking about someone who's in the prime of life that should be at work, who has not put in 30, 40 years of working, but has barely put anything in their life. That sleep became more important than them. Sleep became more important than God, people, and work. We know that rest. We know that there's nothing wrong with entertainment at times, but these things have, for this person, it's become out of whack. Its priorities are out of their place. And so we need to understand that, you know what, though we need rest, it should not become more important than anything else, more than God, more than people and family, more than providing, more than working as we ought to be. And so everything's going to be balanced. Rest and work, doing everything in the glory of God. And as well that we can learn that this person, they wasted time. Well, we are to not waste time. We, Paul talks, the Bible talks about redeeming the time for the days are evil, that the days are growing shorter towards when Christ is going to return. And so we've got to use our time wisely. We've got to be alert. We've got to seize opportunities when they come. But this foolish son let opportunities pass him by. The foolish son did not redeem the time. The foolish son did not use his time wisely and for God's glory and honor. While the believers, well, you are to use your time for God's glory. You're not to waste time. You're to use your time the best you can that God as, as he has given to, to you there. And so we don't want to be like the person who is fully capable of working but refuses to do. Because there's a huge difference between somebody who can't work because of injuries and things like that versus someone who can. And so we want to, do, we want to live for God's glory. We want to use our time. We want to use our possessions. We want to use all these things wisely for God's glory. And so we see that this is a contrast between wisdom and foolishness. And so what are we going to be? We obviously, we want to be wise. And we need God's help. And we need to ask God's help because we can't, we're not perfectly wise. We're, we're not perfectly using our time we're for God's glory, but we need His help. We, if we find ourselves wasting time and, and sinning against God, we confess that to Him. We go to Him for forgiveness, and He will forgive us. and will show us mercy and grace, and we can go, go to Him. But we also need, as we grow, the Holy Spirit's help each and every day to make us mindful of how I'm using my time. And if you're wondering how, you, how you're using your time, just start writing on a piece of paper how much time you spent on such and such activity, what you spent here, what you spent, how much time you spent doing this and doing this and doing this, and it'll give you an eye-opening of what you're doing with your time. But we want to live for God's glory and honor.